Hi there, great twelves, and welcome to probably the final video um, with regards to theory for this year. So we've covered and updated everything that we need to do. And these are just a few of the extra items that I found that I hope um, you are aware of and you know and you understand. But let's go through it um, so that we can make sure we've covered everything. So one of the first things I found was um, this picture detailing the layers of the internet. And I think I've done a few shorts videos on what a the surface web, the deep web and the dark web is. So let's have a look at this. When we look at the surface web, this is the part of the World Wide Web or the internet that is indexed and searched by our search engine. So it's indexed by search engines and searchable with standard web search engines. Now, please remember the difference between a search engine and a web browser. The web browser is the piece of software um, like we'll have Google Chrome. Right? This is your web browser that I'm using here. Google is the search engine that's inside the website. That will give me the results um, of whatever it is I'm searching for. Just a side note. So here with the surface web, we can see we've got Facebook websites, Google, etc. Now, when we go a little bit deeper, we see that we have the deep web. So here we can see examples of things like research papers, medical records. Do you think that these things should be up here on the surface for everyone to find? Definitely not, right? That's why it's part of the deep web. So the deep web is made up of non-indexed pages and hence cannot be accessed by a search engine. So when I go and look for it in Google, I'm not going to find it. The deep web content includes anything behind a paywall, uh, or requires sign-in credentials, or the content is blocked by some sort of index in web crawlers. The size of the deep web is estimated to be above 90% of the internet. And examples include, like I showed you, medical records, fee-based content, membership websites, etc. Okay, so we now know what the surface web is and the deep web. So, this is the place you don't go to. The dark web. <laughs> I've been there a couple of years ago. Um, I remember when the internet first came out, we heard about this. I went to explore it once and I won't go back. Just for the things that yeah, I saw there. Like, no. Okay, so here we've got our dark web. We've got things like anonymous, silk road, tour, illegal information. And here we find that the dark web is also part of the internet. It's also part of the area not indexed by search engines. You don't want to find that stuff just going to Google. The dark web is intentionally hidden from search engines and uses masked IP addresses. So it masks whatever your particular IP address is and is only accessible with a special web browser, something like Tor. And you have others as well. I can't remember all the names. The dark web is estimated to be about 5% of the total internet. And this part of the dark web is unfortunately, or there is a part of the dark web that's unfortunately a hub for illegal activity. Okay, so this is why we know it's there and we just stay clear of that. There's no need for us to be there. Um, I think the surface and the deep web is enough for us. <laughs> right, the next one, cryptocurrencies. This is a question that I know has come up in the June papers. I know it's probably going to rear its head in September, um, the September exam and probably the November exam as well. So just make sure you understand what a cryptocurrency is. When we talk about cryptocurrencies, we're talking about a digital currency or an online currency that uses this blockchain technology, making it almost impossible to counterfeit or double spend. It's a form of payment that can be exchanged online for goods and services. Okay, so we need to know what that is. Um, this is another definition where they talk about cryptocurrency as a medium of exchange, created and stored electronically in the blockchain, um, has no intrinsic value, has no physical form, and its supply is not determined by a central bank. So that's if they're asking you for characteristics of a cryptocurrency. Right? Now we know, 
give us here Bitcoin being the best known example. I'm sure all of us know or at least have heard about that. So we hear in the last two slides about this blockchain technology that the cryptocurrency works off of. So we've got, for example, Bitcoin. But now in the background, the ledger that's actually recording the, the transactions, the movements, all of those things, that is the blockchain technology. So let's say for argument's sake, I'm making a transaction and I'm paying someone. So I've got my Bitcoin and I want to make uh, a transaction. The transaction is requested. You have a block that represents the transaction. That block has been created. That block gets sent to every computer within that network or every node in the network. The nodes then validate that transaction. Yes, it is a valid transaction. For doing that work, the nodes receive a reward. And this is where Bitcoin mining and that sort of comes in. And then that block is added to the existing blocks that are already there creating the chain of blocks. And that's why we talk about blockchain. And once that is done, the transaction is complete. Now, this happens very quickly, but this is how it works. So I've seen the questions of what is a cryptocurrency, the characteristics of a cryptocurrency, um, an example of a cryptocurrency, so Ethereum, Ripple, Litecoin, Bitcoin, any of those, and then the blockchain technology understanding or being able to at least say what it is and how it works okay so here they give a few applications um, it can the same technology this blockchain technology can be used for example for voting now i'm using that as an example because we just come through that why would i want to use that for voting and they, they tell us using a blockchain code constitutes sorry constituents could cast votes via smartphone, tablet, or computer, resulting in immediately verifiable results. Plus, when it's on the blockchain, you can't duplicate it. Like, there is no fraud involved there. Um, in the healthcare sector, using this technology to put all the records on there, it means patients' encrypted health information can be shared with multiple providers without the risk of privacy breaches. So, the technology is great, right? And your cryptocurrency works off of that technology. Okay, and then they give a few um, benefits, in other words, some advantages of the blockchain technology, and with advantages and disadvantages, how many do we need to know? Two, right? Increased transparency, accurate tracking, permanent ledger, cost reduction. Um, it's a complex technology, there's regulatory implication, implementation challenges, etc. So... Um, I would advise you just look at at least two of those and know those for these type of questions. Then when it comes to the internet, um, I picked up one or two things and maybe some of them are just a reminder. The first one is contention. And maybe let me, let me actually just jump to this first. Um, throttling and shaping. Now most of us know about throttling and shaping. Remember now that throttling is the intentional slowing down or speeding up of an internet connection by an ISP. Now, why are they doing that? It's used to regulate network traffic and minimize bandwidth congestion caused by a high number of users simultaneously connected to the internet during peak times. And I always use the example of, and I mean, yeah, they give us a picture of throttling. Um, everybody's on the highway and yeah, they're sort of blocking this off um, so that there is a managed uh, version of traffic running through. But think of it this way. Everybody gets home after five. People want to put their phones down, update their phones, log into the internet, maybe put something on the TV. And so all the households are suddenly connected to the internet and they are using it. So this is why you'll find with a normal internet connection that you subscribe to, um, they will tell you that there are peak times where they simply slow down. So you might have a 10 meg connection. When they throttle you, it means that they are now going to slow down that whole line from let's say 10 megs to only five megs during peak times. And here you can see, this is what I'm saying. This reduction can be applied to all types of data. Now that's different to shaping. Shaping 
is when restrictions are applied to certain types of data, such as torrents and streaming. Browsing the web may not be shaped, allowing the user to operate at normal speed. So it's like putting your traffic in different lanes. Some lanes are going to be blocked off and you know slowed down because they don't want all these downloads, um, whereas other lanes are going to be running at normal speed. Okay, so having said that, let's go back to contention. Now, when we talk about the term contention, if this does come up, this is what you need to give them. Here we're talking about the number of subscribers on a single service. Obviously, if you have too many subscribers, then, um, and I'm not talking about YouTube subscribers, we're talking about subscribers to your ISP. I mean, we can always use more subscribers. <laughs> um, Oversubscription may cause congestion. So think about it this way. If everyone in your street or neighborhood is using the one internet connection, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to slow down. So we, I'm giving you this information as well. So that when your parents or when you, um, maybe as an, as an adult, you're busy looking at an internet connection and they tell you the contention ratio is one to five, just understand that that's one connection for five households. So you would ideally, now I know you're going to pay a lot of money for this, but when you look at an internet connection, you want to look at a line that is unshaped, a line that is not going to be throttled, and a line that has a contention ratio of one to one, which means you are the only one on there. So there's no need for any throttling or shaping or slowing down because other people are on there as well. Okay, but this is just so that um, you know exactly what they are talking about when these terms come up. And then I think it was just crowdfunding, yes, and digital footprint. So crowdfunding, just reminding you again, this uses the internet to raise money for a project by raising small amounts of money from many people. So you are getting the funding that you need from the crowd. You're telling people your story, you need funds for this, for that, whatever the case is, um, and people then contribute towards that goal. Then digital footprints, this comes up as well. Um, you want to be careful, obviously, about what you share, where you share, with whom you share, because people, everything we do online, I've said it before, everything we do online is recorded and stored somewhere, okay? You want to be smart about the sites you visit, please do. The emails you open, don't open every email, and the links you click, don't click them. <laughs> if you don't know where it's coming from, delete it, just get rid of it, okay? So let's look at two questions that come up. The first one is from your act, sorry, passive digital footprint, and then you get your active digital footprint. So what's the difference between the two? Well, if we go back, I think I had it here. No. Um, your passive digital footprint is your unintentional online data trail. Look, when you go into the internet, you are going to leave a trail. For example, you go to a website, your IP address that you logged on with is going to be recorded by the site. It's going to identify your, ser your internet service provider and your approximate location. That is your unintentional online data trail. That's your passive digital footprint. However, we have an active digital footprint as well, and this is your intentional online data trail. For example, send in an email. Since you expect the data to be seen, and or saved by the other person, the more email you send, the more your digital footprint grows. So if you are sending emails online, you're busy with messages, you're watching some videos, you're posting some things online, that all goes towards growing your digital footprint. Okay, so grade 12, I think that's it from me. Um, I think this covers really everything you need to know. And I think in some upcoming videos, I'll be focusing on um, the papers leading up to your prelims, looking at the last three years as well. Um, and then we'll go into looking at, well, theory and prac, and then later on in the year, uh, your finals. So all the best for your tests, exams, and the year that lies ahead.